know it's no pain, no gain Go hard till the end What's the use of playing a game If you ain't aiming to win my feet my name is Shang. My company called Ski House. Ski House is e-commerce platform for ski. So we have a search engine for Ski House, lift tickets, and we solve the two pain for skier. One is housing and lift tickets. And we actually have a vision to create a mobile social app for ski, including everything carpooling, equipment exchange, sell, clothes, uh, road condition, weather, and we like to eventually become to a worldwide online ski club. There are 30, 350 million people ski every year. The market is $38 billion worldwide. Our website launched a few months ago. Right now we have 250,000 visitors. We are ranked top on the Google search for ski-related keywords. And uh, we, uh, we make money from uh, booking commission from housing and lift tickets. Myself, I uh, came to this country 15 years ago. I had MBA from and, uh, New York University. I was CFO with UCLA Student Housing. Three of other members are IT background. Way past 15 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. I'm done. Thank you. Great. That's my story. Enjoy the Appreciate it. Well, um, first of all, I'll say that regarding the prize, it's the best presentation, not necessarily the best business plan. So presentation skills to me do count because you are selling an investment idea to potential investors. And um, so overall, your passion's great. The, the, um, the um, integrity that you have to it uh, is good. Um, if I, and, and you seem very um, committed to it. There's no question about that. If I was to give you a couple thoughts, I would very quickly, in the very first uh, sentence or two, nail uh, what is the problem. And you suggested it, if I want to think about it, uh, that the problem is probably the, um, the dynamics of trying to find a ski, uh, to, to coordinate a ski vacation, you know, to get the hotel and this and the rentals and the ski ticket. But I'd nail that right up front that, because you're going to get an immediate traction with people who have experienced that. Uh, you know, I figured it out a little bit later on down uh, as, as you started the pitch, but you want to get that engagement right away. So. The problem I'm solving is the pure hassle and wear and tear on the head of trying to coordinate a ski vacation, which should be a lot of fun and ends up being a lot of work. Uh, if, you, if that's what it is, I'm, I don't know if I words in your mouth. Okay, and then uh, generally speaking, uh, if you're, you know, this is the elevator pitch. You're going to talk to somebody on the way up, and he says, "Well, tell me what you do." Uh, you you kind of give an impression of what, what do you want? What's the next step? If I'm interested, what's the next step? You can contact me at, I'm, I'm here, or I'm presenting at, or something. You ask me, give me an ask, okay? Can I follow up to you with a coffee? Can I call you for a coffee meeting? Something like that. No, other than that, it's good. Yeah, I, I, I promised I was going to speak very little. No, I don't no, want to no, take you, the time. Yeah, uh, you know, I think it was a good pitch, too. I think also just being a, a, a sometimes skier, I didn't quite feel the pain. But uh, you definitely hit the TAM. Uh, the one thing I was kind of worried about, uh, what is your sustainable competitive advantage and what's the competitive landscape? Um, you know, there are always competitors, even if there aren't really any competitors, there's there's got to be something out there. Uh, but overall, I think it was it was a good pitch. The one thing that also I would just say, if you have a sustainable competitive advantage, uh, you're obviously going to get lots of data on a really rich audience from a demographic standpoint. They probably are, you know, in the upper socioeconomic scale. So, you know, how you manipulate that data is probably something where you could get a lot of IP in. I'm not an IP lawyer, but, and I don't play one on TV either. But, um, you know, think about what what you can do to give yourself a defensible position. Because if you are great, people are going to copy you. Cool. Thank you. Good traction over there, too. Thanks, John. Do I need this? Uh, you can They just speak really loudly. Are you sure? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I get real jazzed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just kidding. I'll, I'll use the mic. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Uh, so, a little over 15 years ago, a company called Salesforce was started to help businesses better engage with their customers. 
Today, local governments across the United States take in millions of requests from citizens every day. They use nothing better than pen and paper, Excel, and a lot of elbow grease to make all of this happen. So we built Romulus to help them manage those incoming citizen requests, collaborate with departments across the entire governmental organization, and then provide targeted responses to constituents about the issues they care about most. The market is massive. Global government IT and software is about $450 billion, which is really a bullshit metric. Um, but our space in particular is billions of dollars of annual recurring revenue to providing CRM systems for government. We are not uh, building a Tinder and we can't help you find a taco truck. But we believe that solving the pain point that everyone has in interacting with their government on a day-to-day -day basis is really something worth dedicating our lives to. Thank you. What was your first name again? Chris. Chris. Thanks. Well, good start. Good enthusiasm. You've got a good voice. You projected extremely well, and uh, you come across passionately. And that's that's very good. Um, government's a unique market, and I happen to have spent 18 years in it, also selling to government. So it's a big it's a big challenge right now. There is a big movement which you could quote. Virtually everybody knows that big data and big government are going together, meaning the government has so much data that they are not distributing or making available. There's a massive uh, number of companies, not massive, but a number of companies going in and saying, provide us the data, we will make it and massage it and make it valuable to the end user. Okay, so you might want to think about riding that wave that the next step after the big data is available is where's the service level? Because right now we all have gone to government for something, business license, you name it, and we know what that's like. Just take your normal DMV experience, right? Yeah. So um, I, I, I think it'd be good to really, uh, in a realistic way, I, I don't know how much validation you've had, but I'd want, if I'm an investor, I'd want to hear real quick, how did you validate that this is such a pain point that they will pay to solve? Because right now, the performance level in government is so low, perceived low, that you know unless you pay them a, you know provide funding for them to raise the level they're not going to raise the level they really want more income and, and staffing yeah. they don't want automation so i think you've got to get around that that's my first issue i'd address that if i were you but overall good presentation yeah i love the energy too thank yeah. you yeah, just the one thing that i kept thinking about wow this is so huge yeah. how long is this going to take you know for sales cycle for enterprise is really long how long is the sales cycle and i think you know one thing that i maybe suggest is to tell the investor where you're going to tackle you know, what you're going to tackle first you're going to take bite-sized chunks out of local government you know federal agency that is a particular pain point for you know whether it's immigration or whatever it is yeah. because otherwise i just have no sense as to what your go-to-market strategy is yeah. just it seems so huge it's like i don't think they're going to be able to tackle at all yeah. okay Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I look at the website, it looks really nice, so check it out. Oh, thank you. Yeah, RomulusApp.com. Romulus, Romulus app. Okay, next one. Next person, who's pitching? I am. Okay, go ahead. Thank you very much. I'm Ken Chester from Culture Mesh. Uh, I can start by asking, uh, who of you have d did not grow up here in the Bay Area? Have a show of hands. Okay, like quite everybody? a few, and myself included. Um, and who's used Google Maps? This is obvious, uh, quite a few people. So you'll probably understand what I've created here is, for me, I came from Michigan, so I put in Google Maps essentially from Michigan to, let's say, San Jose. And we create networks out of any to and from geography combination. I used to uh, run international orientation for a college back in Michigan, and that market is huge. And now we're importing Twitter posts where you have hashtags, say hashtag Michigan, hashtag San Jose. We pull that into the relevant network that matches that diaspora population. And that's Culture Mesh. We've been uh, in public beta for about a month and a half now. Cool, excellent. So Ken, what, what exactly does Culture Mesh do? You referred to the, we, we're not, we didn't grow up here and uh, we're from another place and uh, we use Google Maps. I didn't get what you do though. Well, yeah, we, we uh, if you have the to and from Google Maps, yeah. let's say you have from Michigan in, yeah. uh, let's say uh, San Jose, we 
put those two, two geographies into a network. So you have a network of people from Michigan in San Jose, or you know, from Indonesia in California, and so on. So what if uh, those people in San Jose don't want to hear from me coming from Michigan? Oh, the, <laughs> the other people from... Uh, I'm, I'm here. I don't want anybody coming and finding me from the <laughs> Michigan. <laughs> well, I guess you wouldn't want to be on there. Okay. <laughs> All right, right. Well, overall, good presentation in general. Uh, you got to get to the pain point, you know, that when people come out here, they're lost, basically. And I came out here five years ago, and I want to mention this. To the extent you can, tell a story. Tell your personal story. I came out here five years ago. I was lost. These intersections all looked the same. Uh, and I started using Google Maps. And I realized, geez, I don't know anybody here. And it took me a long time. And I realized, you know, with the social network we have, we could build that. I could say, I'm coming from here. Who's willing to it, it, not entertain me, but give me a little help to get started? Yeah, I, I kind of agree. I was a little lost as to, I didn't know there was some kind of map application or, I you know. Shops, like yeah. All the good um, yeah, you know, the one thing I would say, and this, is, this, is, this goes to a couple of other folks as well, I think it seemed like maybe there was a lot of deep domain expertise. If you have a team, and I think the team is one of the most important things, you know, for any investor, but if you have a team that has really deep domain expertise, has been together for quite a while, you know, you really want to mention that as well, because I think that gives you lots of credibility. If you've been there and done it before, obviously, you know, do that. But, you know, I kind of haven't heard a whole lot about the team in anyone's, and you had extra time. So I would definitely hit on it. Ken, you said you did something with universities before. What was that? Uh, yeah, I was the international orientation coordinator. Right. So, uh, I'd help people to come from other countries. Right. Did you read the Wall Street Journal today? Not today. Well, today is an article about how the number one, the massive influx of students who want to come, foreign students who want to come to the U.S. for the university training, in particular China. Yeah. You've got to be in that market. You got the background. I mean, this is nice, this thing, but take your expertise and go into that market with what you know technology-wise and start creating orientation programs on the iPad, on the cell phone, all the stuff for students coming here so that when they arrive, just like you came out here from Michigan, guess what? They tie into who's local, who's from their town, all that kind of stuff. I think that's a better play for you, frankly. Thank you very much. Same with a lot of uh, developers moving up here, and it's it's not you know I'm from Romania, and it would be nice to have you know other Romanians in my network. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Mauro Pelosi, and today I will introduce you Highway Fi. Highway Fi is the first software-based home security system. What do you need? Actually, it's very easy. Everybody has a home Wi-Fi router, okay? No modification whatsoever, 2.4 or 5 gigahertz, no problem. It's here, okay? Then you just need to install a simple uh, software application, either in your phone or in your tablet, washing machine. Anything with Wi-Fi can actually become motion detection sensors up to 1,000 square feet. And where is the catch? Actually, every one of us is the catch. In fact, human body reflects radio waves, and we can scatter and absorb radio waves as well, and we change the oscillations in the power that is transmitted every second by the router. We have won the CS award as best product of the year for software and mobile apps this January in Vegas. We are already running a pilot with a major mobile operator, and we can disrupt the home security business because instead of paying $40 per month, you can just pay $2 per month, and we make actually revenue sharing for cable operators, mobile companies, and even home security providers. Right now, actually, we are seeking our next uh, seed round, and uh, I would like so much to access to some further introduction and connection with respect to corporate uh, sales section. Thank you so much. Oh, Can you sign me up? Yes. <laughs> well, say your first name again. Mauro. Mauro. So, first thing, you're speaking too close to the microphone, and it distorted a number of words. You know, you can see where I am here, and that's on purpose. So you. You were right. All right. I didn't quite get exactly what this is. It takes a uh, so a uh, some type of router, I assume, with your cell phone, and I, I just didn't follow it. Okay. Go ahead. Yes. Actually, you know, any router as any it router, is right router. now, okay. any router sends a beacon every yeah. second is called a CC in a strength, technically, right. okay? And if 
This is the receiver, okay? It's something you already have at home, actually. This scans the system and send you a notification in case there is an alert. It can work with any kind of uh, Wi-Fi equipment, and uh, it is to be integrated right now with cable companies in set of boxes, actually. I see. So you're going to bring digital, di digital television shows. Is that the idea, or...? You're going to watch home something? Home security. Home security. I got it. Okay. Motion detection with your own Wi-Fi network. But you still need all the detection devices. No. We don't need any detection device because they are the one you already have at home. We don't sell you any hardware. Okay. Okay. It's a software but the user, you install in those. Use your app. You need detection devices, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. And you connect them in with the wireless and the iPhone. And yes. I got it. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, I just think, I'm trying to get that down real quick. It's home detection, something like that. Uh, it took a little while to figure that out, but you got good enthusiasm. Keep the microphone a little bit away from yourself, and it'll come across a little I more make clear. The same mistake, though. We all do. Yeah, I had the same question. <clears throat> it seemed like there was software. I've got washing machines that have that they you know, call home when there's a problem, whatever. So I totally get that. I think that would be great. We are not having to have the uh, have all that equipment installed. Um, so I, I still don't get it. the software, I just download that onto my phone or any device and that, I mean, how do I get that, um, you know, all my devices speaking to one another? So imagine if you are Comcast, okay, yep. you just make a firmware upgrade, okay. a firmware upgrade through your own routers and you don't have to have additional okay. software, Great. A different additional hardware to provide the totally get it now. service. Totally get it. Yeah. So you're a couple dollars a month and you're protected. Yeah. So it, just one thing though, if there is an alert, what happens? Is it tied into emergency personnel, police, or I just get an alert that there's an issue in my home? We have escalating notification platform so that at least your close family members, your neighbors, or your friends will be contacted and alerted at the same time. So there's a centralized uh, alert system, but we don't provide ourselves the service for actual uh, uh, go and check because this is the business model of a uh, larger security company like ADT. We are more mm -hmm. towards the do it yourself segment, actually. Thank you. Um, okay, and I want to remind everyone um, that um, this is non-rebuttal feedback, so um, you would have to uh, listen to what the panel says, uh, but we can answer questions. There's a lot of people in the room that we need to uh, pitch, and I don't want to keep you too long. So we're going to uh, try to move a little faster, and then um, if you have questions for the panel, you can follow up later with them and uh, give them your business card, ask for business card, you can follow up, okay? So um, who's next? Hello, my name is Mark Burkell, and um, I'm not really looking for money yet. I'm just sort of looking to learn how to pitch because I come up with ideas all the time, and I think that one of these days when I come up with the right idea, I want to know how to pitch. So I'm going to pitch my spam filtering company as a test thing just to get practice at this. So I have a spam filtering company. It's called JunkEmailFilter.com. I've been doing this for 12 years. I'm a one-person company, and um, I'm competing against a lot of companies that are giving it away for free and it's still being fairly successful at it. I work from home and I make six digit figures working about two hours a day. What I do differently than most spam filtering companies is that I look at every spam as a business model. Uh, the spammer is, has to dis distribute the spam, the spammer has to sell you on something, the spammer has to get you to do something. They want you to click, they want you to reply to the email, they, and, and they have to have a way of uh, you know, getting your money eventually. So I, what I do is I write rules that target what they're doing rather than just you know, looking at text and trying to run Bayesian filters on it. Uh, I also look actively for uh, good email, you know, as opposed to just looking for spam so that all the good email comes through. So anyhow, uh, my biggest problem with my business, well, I'm done, I'm one person company. All right. So, Mark, right? Yes. Okay. So, 
one of the things um, you don't really have a business model that you want to promote but you got this idea and you're making some money in, and that's good I think what uh, sometimes you can get out of these sessions are extensions and partnerships and people who could um, be synergistic to you right. so I'm gonna give you one his name is Jim to TWO I don't know why uh, Jim to he uh, specializes in suing spammers Okay. And I think there might be some synergy, some potential for you and what you what you do. I would do. love to work with somebody like that. That's right. I could provide them with plenty of Exactly. You could provide them with all the evidence they need and all the diagnostics and so on. So it's TWO Jim 2. He lives in uh, Aptos. And is Google, Google him. And uh, I'm going to give out something here. It's uh, what I'm looking for. But my an email contact is on, on my sheet here, too. You oh, oh I'm in trouble then. Being sued yeah, for spam. Could be, could be if you're a spammer. Yeah. Just the one thing I would say, you know, you pitched your company and what you're doing, and I was waiting to hear what, what it is that you're actually doing with this data that you're getting. You're going to make smart data out of this uh, spam uh, spam stuff. I, 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 I kind of thought you said you were making a business out of this. I just provide a service for people blocking bad emails. Okay, I cool. did something with the email that they actually block. Go ahead. I do sell some of it to other spam filtering companies as uh, data. Yeah. Hi, my name is Anwar. I'm founder of Physics IST. Uh, it's a uh, physics problem solver for iOS, which helps high school students to uh, solve physics problems and it's better. So, for example, I'm a ninth nice grade student and uh, I'm, I'm doing my homework and trying to solve some physics problem and I don't know how to do that. I just open the Physics IST, insert all the even variables in the problem, for example, acceleration is equal to 2 meters per second, mass is 22 kilograms, time is 10 seconds, and then, then I click to calculate, uh, then it shows me all the variables which are possibly maybe calculated based on the given data. For example, I need impulse. I click on impulse, it shows me all the solutions for different cases. Um, with a list of uh, formulas. For example, uh, the first solution is always the most relevant. Uh, it says, uh, firstly find force, F equal to MA, then, far, then uh, find impulse, J equal to FT, and so on. Yeah. Uh, we came up with this idea four years ago. We launched a PC version, and uh, we collected more than 15,000 downloads in a very short period of time. And only after four years, we realized that it was a great idea and had to continue working on it. And now we do. Uh, we tested our product on a Glinko book, which is part of uh, the uh, Las Vegas high school, high school, high schools, uh, and uh, it was able to solve. 65% of the of the problems for that, from that book. Um, okay, your time is up. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's fine. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not absolutely sure I understand the pain. Um, so I have a I have a couple of young daughters and a very young son. Uh, I'm not sure if I want them just opening up an app and you know going in and solving the problem without really understanding how to how to solve the problem. Uh, you know. Yeah, so I didn't really get that. I, I was trying to figure out maybe because you were sort of doing this and I was kind of catching every sort of word. Um, it was a little difficult, but uh, yeah, maybe just articulate the pain a little bit, you know, uh, more clearly and then, you know, how this helps them with an understanding as to the problem they're trying to solve. So lots of energy. Uh, you're, you're simply speaking too fast, okay? Uh, you want to slow down. Now, look at my pace of speaking. You can understand it. Um, take your time. Get the idea right. And your, your problem, I think, the problem you're solving is that I assume high school students have nowhere to go when they're doing their physics homework until the next day of class. I think that's the problem. And they may entirely miss the entire opportunity to have a lesson reinforced. You have a, an application, I assume, that does that. And you make the point that Parents today probably can't solve the high school physics problems that their students or children are being given. Probably can't. You can give us some stats, but you, as, as Roger said, you really got to bring this problem up because it, you went way over it. And you talk way too many features, but your energy is good and it's something you can improve on without a question in terms of being clear. Thank you. Okay, who's next? Thank you. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Right here, right here. We're Naked Lab. Wow, this is really loud. Just hold it, hold it close to your chest. Right here. We're Naked Labs, and we're building a 3D scanning smart scale. 
one that tracks your shape, not your weight. <clears throat> we actually went and looked at the market and we realized everything that's out there on the market today is measuring what we're doing to our body. I fit when I hit 10,000 steps, it vibrates and it feels great. But I don't know how my body responds, yet that's what I care about most. We're building a scale that scans your body in 3D to track your results, guiding you to your true form. We do this by using a combination of infrared and stereoscopic optics vision. We get your measurements, we get 500 measurements from that 3D scan that you see there, and we track those over time. We're able to partner with gyms. I actually am a fitness instructor at Bay Clubs. My background is double E engineering. Uh, we're able to partner with gyms and mark, open a marketplace of trainers where they're actually tracking you via the scans that we have and uploaded. Right now, we just opened up a seed round to take our alpha prototype into a beta prototype. We're raising a 750K round. We've already raised 20% of that. And I look forward to hearing from you guys and if you take a look at our scans. Thank you. Thank you. So pretty good presentation. Um, you know, you, you, you had it together pretty well. Because um, you have a product, you're up and running, you're raising it around. Again, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd suggest a couple minor adjustments. I'd get to the problem definition earlier because you've got a gym or trainer experience. Yeah. I'd start, I'm a trainer. I've been a trainer for X years. Qualify yourself very quickly. The biggest single problem I see for people attempting to improve their conditioning or lose weight or whatever is the fact that we can't track the beginning and end. It's too subjective. They feel better. We, we decided, we, because of this experience, we saw something and we decided to build an app that would do it. Guess what? It wasn't easy, but this is how we, what we do today. Something like that. That's the story you want to give. Um, I, I think that's probably enough. Overall, good. You got you a few improvements. This will be, uh, it'll, it'll really fly. Thank you. Can I, can I say one thing? We actually, uh, <laughs> one, one thing. thing. <laughs> We're actually, it's not an app. It's a scale that you stand on and it scans your body in 3D. It's kind of a weird angle, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's I'm not a, sure I want that. Yeah, well, that's the long and the short of it. Um, okay. <laughs> oh, I didn't want to. I didn't want to leave him hanging. Um, <laughs> I, thought, I knew I'd get a rise out of you. It's a comedy um, show, in case you didn't know. It's a comedy show here. Yeah. How far do you want to extend it? <laughs> yeah. No skin off my nose. Um, it's on the record, yeah. Roger. The uh, we're filming. I think a great, great presentation. I got the scale, and I thought this is really just. Disruptive. I don't know if there's anything else out there that's doing it, uh, anyone else that's doing it, but um, I would hope that you've got lots of provisionals filed yes. on how you're doing yeah. this. Yeah. And if you do, I would absolutely mention that in your presentation because if you have a sustainable competitive advantage and no one can play in your field, I think that's very important to investors. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And, and this is actually from our alpha prototype. Okay. So who's next? Anne? We're going to go like that. Anne? You want to Yeah. Bell. Yeah. Amy. It's always nice to see women right here. Yeah. Woohoo. I'm pretty early. This is uh, basically my first big one. So. so, wearables are an exciting space for personal data right now. But what about a wearable that solves a pressing social problem? And for a group of people that doesn't already carry, wear a supercomputer in their pocket. There has been a dramatic social change in one generation where 98% of us parents played outside in our neighborhoods in our free time when, when we were kids. And now that number is down to 6%. And the indoor, in automobile, and behind screen alternatives are presenting unknown and large uh, mental and physical health risks to, to families. Placelets are a social wearable that solve, that are designed specifically to rebuild those neighborhood play networks. Uh, they do this by allowing kids to instantaneously and spontaneously gather, signal each other to gather, and they send signals back to parents' mobile phones about the whereabouts of their kids to give them peace of mind. Um, our team, which is uh, me, the CEO, in, uh, with a background in entrepreneurial marketing from Stanford and Wharton as well, and a PhD by um, mechanical engineering designer from Stanford and IDEO, um, who have 
we're deploying our alpha product in a test neighborhood in the next three weeks and we are looking for three hundred thousand dollars in our seed round in order to um, deploy our go-to-market strategy polish up the beta version of our product and sell our first devices in 2015 so placelets is an opportunity um, to preserve to restore the habitats from the best the memorable habitats from our past for the future and current generation thank you amen <laughs> um, yeah, I think, you know, having three young kids, I really feel the pain and I'm always trying to get them outdoor. Um, I wasn't quite sure, are you a software company, a hardware company, both? It's Is this, wearable. it's a wearable, okay, so you're providing the software and the hardware. Yeah, yeah social networking. Uh, okay, yeah, so I guess the one thing that I would, I would say, you know, good presentation, your first one, you seem like a pro, uh, you did really, really well. Um, I, I think the one thing I'd want to know just as a parent is a little more on the security. I kind of would have a bit of heartburn just with my 10 year old, uh, you know, gathering spontaneously with other people. And if there's an issue, maybe getting alert or something, I don't know. So I'd want to just know a little bit more about the security and what you guys are doing there. Well, good presentation. I mean, you seem pretty polished. I'm not sure why you're uh, acting like this is so new because you seem like you've been doing this for a while. Either you, you're a good presenter or you got lucky when the well she went to warden right Woo -hoo, yeah. for warden. so i mean but you told a good story i'm a, That's I'm a grad I like. so i listened to the story i gauge i could follow you exactly um the next question is well tell me more and that's what you want tell a story where you say tell me more so good done. good job thank you okay. who's next Wendell? who's next yep Hi, uh, so I'm a language learning geek. Um, I've been learning languages all my life and um, there is still not yet one service or one app or one website that I can go to to learn a foreign language. And or I could recommend to someone and say, they go there from zero and six months or a year later, they come back with some basic minimal fluency. And uh, I want to solve this problem with a startup company. And um, there's, so I want to make the product case today. Um, uh, companies have taken two strategies to, to create uh, online uh, language learning content. One is to replicate the school's model and just put teachers online. Um, the other strategy is to take um, a lot of sort of self-study, uh, old-fashioned self-study methods like showing flashcards or showing like matching things and putting those online and uh, neither of these two strategies work. Um, uh, 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 a company like Rosetta Stone has about 5 million subscribers. Um, Duolingo was a new company, got 50 million subscribers in two years. If they were successful, they would have like 500 million users. Um, it's hard to gauge the scale or the size of this market in the US, but internationally, um, there's a really big market for language learning, especially English. Um, so th uh, the strategy that, uh, that I'm taking is to disrupt the language learning, uh, the language learning uh, industry completely. And so this not and get rid of the school's model and get rid of the old self-study model and make language learning more like a media industry. So we want to produce a lot of video content. Okay. All right. What's your name again? Brandon. Brandon, yeah. So um, pretty good. Now I'm going to give you a couple thoughts. One, uh, whenever an investor hears um, you know, there's nothing else out there teaching English, that's a dangerous statement because it attacks or weakens your credibility. There are many, many. You mentioned it later, Duolingo. There's lots of apps out there. Maybe they're not doing it as well as you could do it, but there are many, many apps. There are even apps out there that obviously uh, have people partake in movie parts and you know have a, uh, watch a video and have this taking place. And there's uh, even apps coming out of Berkeley now that are um, taking very specific areas of uh, lifestyle you know, discussions and conversions. So there's many, many apps. It's a crowded space. Global English is one of them. Uh, Duolingo is another one. So I'd stay away from that. There's nothing. I'd just say I believe in my experience something has led you to believe you got a better mousetrap. You got a better method and then talk about that. Okay. Oh. Good. Thanks. Uh, 
Yeah, good presentation. I think you should practice a little more if you are going to, you know, definitely go in for, for pictures. You want to be really polished. Um, the one thing that I, I would say, I think people generally recognize that the uh, language business is really big. These are huge TAM. Everyone's heard of Rosetta Stone. Uh, the, the one thing I kept wanting to know was like, okay, so what's your differentiator? And, you know, you sort of went through all of this other stuff telling us how big the market was, and I think people really recognize that anyway, but I didn't get to hear any of your uh, differentiator. So I think get there quicker. Cool. Uh, uh, thank you so much. And uh, earlier today, I was interviewing uh, Jim for Lifecraft TV, and um, I said, you know, give me three things that people don't know about you. And um, he started, um, you know, languages was one of the uh, one, one of his passions, and he speaks quite a few languages. Uh, he is a very very interested in the uh, education space, uh, so this uh, definitely hits the spot. But um, he was also telling us about an initiative that uh, he's working on. And um, Jim, would you like to say yeah. a few words about it? Yeah, I will. So. So, um, yes, I've been, I've been in Sand Hill for 10 years, I invest, but you know, most, uh, everybody's, uh, almost, not everybody, but most who are investors have run companies. And ultimately, we go back to our roots. We run companies, and so I run two educational companies. One of them teaches literacy uh, and math, uh, K through, actually pre-K, but K through eight. And this year, this summer, we are introducing uh, technology classes. We are going, we're finding a new paradigm that goes reading, writing, programming. You learn your math in programming, but you must learn to read. It's a key skill, because once you learn to read, you can read to learn. I mean, you can educate yourself. But if you can't read to begin with, you're just, you're, you're, you're history. Writing is very important if you're going to communicate with other humans, right? Next thing, get into technology. So we have started now this summer, coming up in the camps at First Focus, which is company I operate, a series of technology classes. And why I'm giving you guys this information is I'm looking for teachers. I'm looking for guest speakers. I'm looking for people who can be inspirational to these kids. Here's the brochure. I'm going to leave it up here. In the back, these are the first six, uh, yes, eight classes, six, seven classes, I'm sorry, HTML, CSS, under the Learn to Code movement, Intro to Python, Into the Java, Podcasting, Basic Blogging, uh, Digital Editing of Images, Video for Presentations. We'd love to do more. I'm sure. Maybe pitching? Uh, could be pitching, well, yeah, but I'm short of teachers, and I think this would be a great crowd. Again, be a guest speaker. There are one-week classes, nine to four, lunch break. You could teach three hours, you could teach one hour, you could, whatever you want. So the brochures are here, and I'm always there, too. Thank you, that's a great initiative. Thanks, Jim. And I pay, oh yeah, it's a paid job. It's a paid job, you know. Sorry. You can, you can well, you spend can, your you, company. Yeah. Yeah, I'll leave these Each here. Year. I'll leave these here, you guys can help yourself. I'm sorry. Right, okay. Hi, my name is Alex. I'm CEO of MX Hero. Our product is Mail to Cloud. What Mail to Cloud does is it converges email with cloud storage. And when email is converged with cloud storage, this is very transformative of the email experience. We can all uh, identify with searching for attachments in email. What if those attachments were automatically uploaded to your cloud storage? Everything you sent, everything you received, so you could immediately find it. Uh, we've been at this uh, for for three years, we have about half a million users, um, active users. We uh, have some recent good traction in the enterprise space uh, with companies like Dolby, Electric. Uh, our last deal uh, this month was a three-year contract for 130,000. Um, we are right now looking at raising 500k in a um, in a convertible note that will take us from our really uh, to to boost our Series A funding, which we're looking to do in uh, in Q4 of this year. Uh, we've had good press, uh, Wall Street Journal, TechCrunch, Venture Beat. Uh, we're um, looking forward to being in the um, the Gartner Group report as uh, for 2015 uh, cool vendors uh, in, in the collaboration space. Can you say what mail the cloud is again exactly? Okay, sure. It's the convergence of email with cloud storage. So, which would be you sending an email to me with an attachment, and it would automatically go to your box, your Dropbox, or whatever, and it. Well, this is always on and automatic, uh, and so and it, and it doesn't require and and um, applications. It, it, there's no, uh, it's server side, so it doesn't require any. Uh, so for companies, it's very attractive for companies because there's no end user installation. Cool. Thank you. Well, good good energy, good presentation. You're very knowledgeable. You you, you talk and speak well. 
I just, you know, kept ringing in Gmail, Gmail, Gmail. And so I think you got to hit that right off the bat. When you say we're mail with cloud services or cloud services for email, the obvious is Gmail, Google. And so you can say, most of you are probably thinking about Gmail, but this is why we're different. Just catch that right off the bat. Other than that, I think it's pretty good. Um, uh, it's good that you make your ask. You're out looking for money, convertible note, 500K round. It's good you put that out there if that's if you've got that much definition. So overall, I think a little bit of work on getting that definition up front and making it clear why you're not a Gmail clone or a lookalike would be good. Yeah, I, same comment. The one thing I got is your big differentiators, and I guess it's a big pain, uh, attachments. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I can't really relate because being in a law firm, they are so maniacal. Nothing can be in the cloud. HIPAA, you know, the whole toot. So um, we're obviously not your target audience, but um, I, I think there's probably a good good um, audience for it there. You I like your it. traction. Half a million users. Good for you. Yay. Okay. Okay. Who's next? So you guys go in order. So. If you don't pitch, just uh, tell the next one. Okay, David. Hi, I'm David Brooks. I'm the CEO of Musicians Guild. We're following in the footsteps of Airbnb and Uber by going after a validated marketplace on Craigslist for musicians. We're building a marketplace and a community for musicians to collaborate. Um, we've launched our product in uh, February at the uh, music educator shows, Texas music educator shows. Musicians uh, is a large market. It's uh, one in seven people make music, a billion people worldwide. Uh, when we launched the product, um, we launched in February, we saw a 35% uh, increase in, in uh, registration in February, 42% in March. Um, we have put together a great team. I've booked nine years at Salesforce.com as VP of Product Management in the uh, Force.com team and built App Exchange. Um, two of my co-founders were professional musicians who uh, worked together for 15 years in a company selling into this market. My CTO built the music uh, subsystem of the Apple iPods, the first five generations. We are uh, we've launched and we're ready to scale. We're raising $750,000 in a seed round and would love to pitch to your angel community. Cool. Thank you. David's, David's a client, so I can't say anything bad. <laughs> yeah, you know, David, I know you and I know what you're doing. Um, what I didn't really get was the real pain, and you know, we've talked so much about this, uh, the pain the musicians have in terms of creating the community, in terms of communicating with one another, and I just, you know, I, I know that pain because I've spent so much time with you, but I didn't get that coming across what the real pain was. So I would just say, make sure you hit that, because without that, people are thinking, you know, what for? So that's what happened. I uh, kept thinking, what does he do? What does he do? You're speaking very well. Got a lot of good speaking presence. Uh, good. Your voice has got timbre. Everything's fine. And I, I'm going, well, and this is what happens. I go, does he do this or does he do that? And so now I'm listening to the rest of your conversation to try to fill in and get that what do you actually do. I don't know if you uh, make collaboration happen or you let them share music. I have no idea. And that's, that hurts you because I've been guessing most of that time. But you could clean that up, I'm sure, pretty quickly. Other than that, it was good. Very good. Great team, by the way. Yeah, you can do that. Hello, my name is uh, Richard Johnson. I'm with a company called ValueThisNow.com. Does anybody in this room have anything at home that you think might be valuable, but you just don't know, and you'd like to know? Show of hands? Okay. Our company is the largest online personal property appraisal website. We currently have over 70 active appraisers, and we're appraising merchandise in 168 different categories. We have an additional 70 appraisers also who are in pending status, who are, they're working their way through the application process. So we're a bit like antique roadshow on steroids. Our sweet spot is anything that's antique, collectibles, and memorabilia, but we can do any household furnishing. So personal property appraisals are expensive, especially ones that are USPAP compliant. And that stands for the Uniform Standards of Professional Appraiser Practice. Uh, uh, expert appraisers charge $150 an hour and up, and those appraisals can take anywhere from two weeks to six weeks to develop. In the event of a natural catastrophe, 
like a, like a hurricane, it can take six months. So our product has excellent utility value for individuals who are looking for confidence when buying and selling, insurance companies who are looking to settle complex damage claims, uh, attorneys who are developing wills and trusts and trying to settle divorce, divorce settlements, and for bankers who are conducting estate sales. We're currently seeking $500,000 for 10% uh, equity in our company in a convertible note. Thank you. Thanks. I got a question I'm going to ask you. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, the, the one thing I was a little confused about, uh, just in terms of your actual business, are you sort of the Uber in uh, personal appraisals, so these people are going to come to my home and appraise, or is it all done through the app? <clears throat> and if it is done through the app, you know, I is it possible to say with any certainty whether or not, you know, that really is the real thing? Um, without someone actually touching and feeling and lifting it. So that was one of the, the main things that uh, that was sort of going through my mind. And I, I don't know how big the market is for, for appraisals. Um, 1.6 billion. Okay. Um, and then the last thing I would just say, it sounded kind of weird, we're doing convertible debt, but we're giving up 10% of the company. I think if you're doing convertible debt, you don't really know how much you're giving up because you're going to price it at the next round. So, and, and even if you kind of are doing a price round, I would leave the valuation out because that's something you want to negotiate. You don't want to negotiate against yourself potentially. Yeah. So I, I had a chance. To, what was your name, Richard? Right. I, I had a chance to speak to Richard um, while we were in the back there having some food, and uh, I, I think um, it's just my style. I think you can be bold. You can say uh, something like you're either going to be. And that's what I was going to ask you. Can he be? Uh, antiques home show or something like that a takeoff because everybody's seen that show now i have to think that show is hoarders heaven okay that's where hoarders go and you know another byline is let's find out how much your wife's junk is really worth and how valuable your stuff is worth something like that you know because this brings humor to a real issue that people think their stuff is worth a lot in the debate whether it is or isn't which i always have with my wife and i'm sure most of you do too, who have wives or family members that uh, some of them want to hoard every, I'm sorry keep everything forever it's so valuable my wife's uh, mother my mother-in-law my god and other people want to get rid of everything and this is a resolution this is a way to put a value on it I mean forget about all that. this is a way to end the fight end the fight about what's worth keeping I think you can have a lot of fun with that okay thank you Okay, next we're moving that way. Who's pitching? Fourth throw. We're gonna wait on you. We're gonna wait. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Hi. Hi, my name is Joe Wu. I'm the founder and CEO of Voice and Communications. Um, if you run a business today, you know it's extremely hard to turn prospect into customer. You have to engage customer 24 by 7 on all the different channels. And the problem with all these channels is that you have to use all these different tools and all these tools does not talk to each other and they're not that smart. What the voice has been building is a smart communication cloud that actually can engage with the customers automatically and intelligently and on a massive scale. This is a trillion dollar telecom industry that people need to communicate with their customers and the smart communication tools are really in the sweet of the whole um, market segment and for Voicent today we are already have more than 10,000 customers worldwide we are a profitable company and our customers are ranging from the very small to the very large HP's, IBM's, FEMA's, British Telecom all customers and with, with us, we believe we are currently at the stage we're going to rapidly grow the company. And we're seeking VC fund to further accelerate the growth. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, I have to ask exactly what is it that you do, though? I, I heard a lot of descriptions. Go ahead. Okay, so it's basically the communication cloud that contains all the communication tools, voice, text, email, web, chat, and with data management, there's also a custom CRM system properly. So it's for corporations? For corporations and small businesses. And what does it solve? The integration of voice and data or just the integration of 
integration of everything. Voice and data and, and data. you know, faxing, everything. So this is like the information hub yes. in the cloud. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, well, I, I think that you've got some headwinds. There are people that do this. I mean, most uh, IBM and all these other corporations claim this, Microsoft, everything else. So I think it's got to be a vertical, a vertical thing. You, you do it with some vertical knowledge, perhaps. You do it in the insurance industry or you solve something in a marketplace with pharmaceutical. I'm not sure, but that's, I'd get to that point pretty quick. Um, and then maybe, um, you know, in, I, I was going to mention this earlier. One of the things uh, I'm going to suggest everybody should do, uh, there's been a huge uh, step up in the number of corporate venture departments or groups out here. Uh, because Silicon Valley is such an innovative place, almost uh, all the major corporations have now established innovation offices. Yours sounds a little generic to me, frankly, if I at first blush. I would get around to some of the telecoms uh, and get around to their offices, offices, I'm sorry, and see if they buy into this because I don't have the domain expertise to know if you've got leverage. But they can tell you very quickly, we already have this, five other companies already have this, you're too late. or you have something we are inter interested in. You're getting great validation because they are the actual distributor of that technology. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I just the one one comment. I couldn't really figure out what's your killer app. Um, you know, I know there are people out there doing the doing this type of thing. I, I just didn't get a sense as to why you're doing it better. What you're doing to make it better. Thank you. Next one. Next one. Okay. Come here. Ask them yeah. If they want to be a teacher, just pick one up on the Sure. Okay, who's pitching over there? Okay, Jim? No. Yeah, we, we go in the order in which you guys signed up, so. Yeah, honey, but you came at the end, so we were all sold out, and I said you're going to be on standby if we have time. Okay? So, hi, I'm Jim um, Mike I'm Jim O'Keefe, and uh, Life Space, Space makes the audio and sensor interface to the smart home of tomorrow. Um, it turns out that the majority of Americans... Just a little higher. Oh, it turns out the majority of Americans, when you ask them, want a smart home, and today they rush out to Home Depot and they buy smart gadgets. Um, and then they feel a little bit bummed that smart gadgets don't make a smart home if you go and ask them afterwards. It turns out the big missing thing is we have absolutely no idea where the people are inside in the house. Uh, or to put it another way, we have no uh, central awareness inside in the house that we could ever offer a service to smart devices. So LifeSpace solves that problem. Uh, a good killer app for us would be d a dynamic media delivery throughout the house. So you set a song going from your smartphone, you walk around the house like so many of us do, and the song just kind of follows you around. The same with your smartphone calls. Same with Siri if you actually have your smartphone tethered. Um, so we have a strong team, Stanford MIT team. We have five patents supplied for in this area. Um, we do have an ask of uh, 500,000 uh, to bring us through this year and get our prototypes converted into a first product, get that out to market through crowdfunding and do the associated marketing with that. Um, and that's, uh, we, we like to say, we want to bring the home to life. Our primary revenue is the analytics, much like Nest. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone. Microphone. <laughs> a good presentation. Um, my, a few mic issues, but uh, apart from that, a good mic, a good presentation. Um, I, the one question I sort of was thinking in my mind: uh, you're looking for the funding, and then you're looking to do the crowdfunding. Uh, I just it seems like to me that this would be a good crowdfunding before you actually go for funding, so you can demonstrate market fit and validate validate your hypothesis. Really, uh, you know, nothing like having you know 100,000 orders to uh, demonstrate market fit. So, uh, did you buy the device somewhere? Did you have it made, or? Oh, well, we, we completely made this, including the, the housing over Okay, well, that's important to bring out, that you have a proprietary device there, or you don't have a proprietary device there, or you have a chip that could be put in anybody's device okay. there, right? And you could get greater distribution because you have wonderful systems integration, software to go with anybody's home, and there's your market, you have your own, but you're going to also OEM this technology. Overall, uh, I agree with Roger. Uh, you speak well. You've got a nice, calm demeanor, and uh, you appear very well informed of what you're doing. Uh, I just think it'd be a little more clear exactly what are you going to do with this. With this, and again, the crowdfunding, or regular funding issue. You don't you don't mix the two, one or the other, you know. And um, I, I think you did a pretty good job. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, next. Who's pitching next? Okay. Okay.
Okay, if you guys don't raise your hand, then I'm gonna go for this gentleman right there. He's been trying to do it so hard. <laughs> go ahead. He's um, he's one of the demo tables too, right? right over there there yes. you go. So, hi, um, I'm Peyton, and I'm one of the founders for Nudge, a C2C mobile advertising platform. So um, with traditional ad networks, you get um, algorithms that try to guess what kind of ads that you might want to be interested in. Well, with Nudge, we actually use your friends and family that um, can help that will help you. Um, that will help place ads into your network, influence your uh, decisions. So as an example, let's say you were to go to a sports bar on a Friday night to watch the Final Four game. Well, you know, of course, you're going to take a selfie. And when you post it, you might not know what to type. Okay? So with Nudge, the business owner can actually suggest words or keywords to go into the um, posting. Okay? So maybe something like, you know, awesome crowd here at the sports bar for UCLA versus NC State. Okay? So several things have happened now. Okay? First of all, the bar owner now gets an impression for all your friends through you, not through them. Second, um, the, the business owner gets to influence your posting. They have some, uh, through the power of suggestion. Third, the NCAA sees this posting and they might do something, right? Maybe put the picture on the Jumbotron or something, okay? So the big difference between Nudge and all the other advertising agencies is that we enable the advertiser to suggest uh, posts for your feed. And so we're Nudge. Come check out our demo. We have a running prototype. Thanks. Thank you. So he's been nudging me from the back there. Well, good presentation style. I like it. Um, it took you quite a while to get to what's different because you've talked about what everybody else does for quite a while. And, um, you know, I, I'm just going to give you my, I have to give you my most candid opinion. First of all, I don't want anybody sending me more ads, number one. Number two, I really don't want everybody knowing where I've been to a sports bar on Friday night when I was maybe supposed to be somewhere else. I, you know, there's some, I mean, young people, it's a young person's app because they don't care. You get a little more responsibility and maybe concern about your, your reputation. You may not want that so much. So uh, I, I think, you know, frankly, just talking to you earlier, I think you've got more you can find. I mean, you've you've got a little bit there but I don't I don't think it's quite enough for the traction you want I think if you keep digging there's other stuff in this market that you could get I, I think that the taking the selfie or whatever it is and I'm a little concerned about giving the owner control of that thing you know that's not a great idea necessarily you know I think if you think about it look around a little bit there's probably other um, so more subtle but more valuable ways to uh, use the service that's my take I had a lot of the same same thoughts going through my head, but also just generally with your pitch, I think you want to say this is where we are, this is the validation, that, you know, give some kind of feedback. I have no idea whether you're in the ideation stage, you're just a entrepreneur, or whether you actually have users out there. So I think you need to talk. Thank you. Okay, if you guys want to pitch, um, I need you to line up over there. How many, how many people are still wanted to pitch? Let's see, one, two, okay. Um, okay, so you're gonna go in the end, and then um, you two, okay? Okay, there you go. That gives me an idea about the time, so you guys can go over there and line up, that way we know how many are left. Good, thank you, go ahead. Hi everybody, my name is Luai. I'm the founder and CEO of Whatcha Doing. Uh, what you're doing is a mobile app where in a single button you can just send all of your friends a push notification on their mobile devices asking them, hey, what you're doing? And they can post back actually putting their mood, location, and photo plus writing what they're doing. So imagine if you're sitting and you're feeling bored at home, you just use the app and you can see who else is feeling bored and <laughs> connect together or plan something to put together. Uh, we also have groups. So for example, for this meetup, they can, uh, uh, the organizers can create a group for this and get the vibe out of everybody who's been at the event. Hey, what uh, you doing? What you doing, exactly. <laughs> Joey style. Um, uh, we're a team of six, and we just launched on Android and, uh, and uh, iOS. Uh, we're targeting US for the first phase, like around 70 million users, and we'll be considering localization and uh, adding different languages for different countries as well. Uh, at this stage, we're, seek we're seeking um, uh, investment with, uh, with the seed fund for, for this time being, and this is uh, uh, what we're doing in, in general. How much are you raising? It's 750. Okay. Thank you. Oh. 
Um, so I didn't hear anything about any kind of traction. Um, and as an investor, I think, you know, just when we go into uh, investment meetings and we're asking for 750 and we have an idea and we don't have any kind of traction, uh, it's a tough ask, you know, because this could be just a real fad uh, or it could be 70 million users. I think one of the things um, I would suggest maybe is to figure out is there any kind of traction you can demonstrate on a small scale, 100,000, 150,000, that you could say we're going to, you know, get signups, we can demonstrate what our CACs are, and um, then just go to an investor and say, this is what we got, we're looking for a little fuel to throw on the fire, because we have a scalable, predictable business model here. I just didn't get that from you. So, um, are you familiar with the term to eat your own dog food? Or the dog eats its own dog food. Do you know that term? You don't, right? Everybody knows that? So, uh, I think uh, you got a bunch of startup community people here. You got a bunch of CEOs, you know. I'd say try it out here. Try it out with this community right here. You're going to learn a lot. I mean, everybody's got very similar challenges along the way. Let's see if you get some traction with this group. Let's see if these guys will start communicating with each other because they're all kind of in the same uh, in the same situation about thinking about how they're going to get their company launch, but it might, it might work. Okay. Your presentation submission. was good. Presentation good. There's you've got. I would suggest you get some defensibility, and the best way to get defensibility in your case is get traction with some community. And you also mentioned the event organizers, so why not track them and see if they would implement your your app? Thank you. Thank you. Hey guys, uh, my name is Diego. My name is Diego. I'm Najid. My name is Diego. I'm the CEO of Banter. So Banter gives you real-time information about local businesses that you actually care about, but you can't find on Yelp, Foursquare, or Google Maps. So on Banter, you can find all the nearby happy hours going on right now. All the local food trucks going, uh, where they are right now. All the places nearby that have live music, DJs, comedy shows right now. So how do we do this? We gather data from across the web and local businesses and provide it back to our users in an amazingly simple and clean map interface. So we launched in San Francisco about three months or so ago. We have uh, almost 3,000 users. We have uh, kind of have month-to-month -month growth uh, in our active users of about 50%. Uh, and more importantly, the feedback has been amazing. We already have emails coming in from New York and LA asking us to expand. Um, so what's next? We're right now getting ready to launch a new feature uh, to make help the app more, um, more social, more interactive, and more ultimately more um, more addictive and so what we're currently launching next is a feature that lets users share with the map the real-time occupancy and vibe of the bars where they are and they can start earning drinks along the way so our team is uh, very lean we've been bootstrapped so far but we're currently raising a two hundred thousand dollar seed round we've got about thirty percent committed and so we're looking for investors to kind of help us uh change the way people go out all over the world thank you invite me to the happy hour Well, a couple of thoughts. You got a very good presentation style. You're, you're, you're uh, clear, confident, loud, loud enough. Uh, so that was great. Very good presentation. Um, you did focus on the bar scene a bit right at the get go, but there's a much bigger market right next to it called the restaurant scene, and that's really a huge market. There are people out there doing it. Uh, you know, the uh, various reservations, open table, what have you. Uh, but that market's still wide open, so I would suggest you, whatever you're doing at bar scene about what's up and what's happening, move into the restaurant scene because people will meet at restaurants of a, a different demographic, of course, as easily, if not easier, than they'll go to a bar. So I would expand the market, triple the size of the market very quickly. Uh, overall, pretty good presentation, though. Good. And um, I, it didn't say exactly what happens. I mean, I, I guess I build this in my network, but you can talk about that later on. Yeah, I kind of had sort of the same thing, but as I was thinking, you know, uh, I'm always thinking in terms of going out to investors, how do we sell the biggest TAM, how do we sell the biggest opportunity for the company, and this really seemed to me, this, this could be platform technology, you should be really maybe selling this as a platform, your first vertical that you're going after is, you know, X, but it's very easily trans, you know, transferable over. Um, and restaurants, uh, you know, just as a parent, there are so many things that I would want to know about that are around where I'm at. I've got these silly apps that really don't tell me anything. This could be great, and especially if you're adding sentiment, you know, that's something that, that other people don't really have. Cool. Thank you so much.
Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm, whoa. I'm Jake and I'm the CEO of Campus Cribs. Campus Cribs is the one-stop shop and nationwide marketplace for off-campus housing. Each and every year, 13 million students look to find their next off-campus home or college roommate. 80% of these 13 million students are going to unsafe, unverified, and spammy uh, services such as Craigslist to find their next off-campus home or college roommate. Um, in solving this problem, Campus Cribs partner with the top five property management software companies here in California uh, and has put 100,000 properties on the map nationwide of 400 campuses. In monetizing our platform, since we cur currently operate, operate, operate as a free service, we intend on charging for listing fees, sublet exchange fees, application fee, rent payment, and partnership referral services. With a 400K seed investment, Campus Cribs is able to perfect its platform, build an app, and expand. Thank you. Thank you. What was your name again? I met you. Jake. Jake. So you're here to get constructive feedback, right? You gotta raise the excitement level. You don't I mean you may be excited, but you don't come off as being excited. So I gotta raise that level. Secondly, I talked to you earlier and you've got a back, a great background. You got you, you ran a housing authority in Philadelphia, correct? Two hundred and eighty ninety unit. You learned a lot. So you right away want to say, Hi, I'm Jake. I encountered uh, a, n a number of issues as I was operating or running a housing unit in Philadelphia for X years, five years, ten years. The biggest issues in housing are one, two, three, four. I came out here, I decided to tackle that problem on a nationwide basis and to start with the college student marketplace. That, there's a good statement for you to start with, but uh, you've got to get the enthusiasm up, I think. It's going to help you. We're not sure if you're just totally a laid back guy or you're not quite excited about it. So. Uh, you got great information, you got a great story. I'd, I'd work on that part. <clears throat> and also just one thing, I didn't really get you know, how you're solving the problem of you know, the Craigslist, crappy, unsafe um, environment for, for my kids. So maybe you just expand on that a little bit more because I didn't really understand how you were solving that pain. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Gene Finley. I'm the founder of My Butler. So I spent the last six years of my career as a management consultant. Uh, 48 out of 52 weeks of the year on a plane, Monday, Thursday, Friday, coming back in, taking this shirt off, throwing it in a corner and looking for ways to spend time with my family and friends. I looked for a way to solve that problem. I didn't want a personal assistant because they're not really personal. They don't really know or care about me. And I didn't want a concierge. I can book my own baseball tickets. I have an Amex card, it's whatever. I wanted a butler. I hired a European butler. And so my butler is an on-demand butler service that is subscription-based where you pay a fee every month to get access to a really high-end, uh, personalized butler that learns what's important to you and continues to provide that same consistent service over and over again. Thank you very much. Cool, send me up, I need one. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm just a great presentation, great poise, uh, great delivery. Um, I'm just wondering, how big is this market? How many people are looking for butlers? Uh, so um, I would say it's about the same size of the market as for task rabbit. So I mean, you know, if you we're specifically targeting really, really busy professionals, um, and so the yeah. whole market size perspective is the exact same size. As yeah, I don't know how big Task Rabbit is. I know it's big, but uh, you know, I, I I can see my wife calling a handyman because she won't let me fix anything. There's always pieces left over that are not necessary. But I'm not sure that she'd be calling a butler. So. Yeah, great, very good presentation, James. Um, uh, Gene, sorry. Wh and what was your management consultant area in? What strategy? strategy. Okay, fine. So that's a great story. You came back. Um, I think you kind of need a little of the moniker, the Uber for personal services or the something for something. For, I, I mean, because you, you got a good story and you might just say something to the extent of um, your personal experience was you benefited. What was the benefit to you? You just became so relaxed or you enjoyed it so much and it wasn't that much money. You know, that's I'd bring that out because there's a, oh, this is going to cost me 500 bucks an hour or something like that. For a reasonable amount of money, you can have a butler three times a week or twice a week to take care of all these tasks who knows and cares about you. So I think you got a good story there. Appreciate it, thank you. 
Thank you. And just out of curiosity, how much is a butler? Um, our package starts ninety nine dollars a month. Ninety nine dollars a month. There you go. So I, I could I could get one. How many hours is that? That is not how it's based on what we call Oh cool. There you go. You have a couple couple clients already. Here here is. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Fred Dominioni, and I am the founder of Better Exec. Think executive or execution. Um, just a couple of words about myself. So I've been in the Bay Area for 15 years. I've uh, worked at uh, various startups, five uh, to be precise, uh, in a senior capacity in sales, um, essentially driving millions of dollars of pipeline, uh, managing as little as five executives to as many as 100 executives, two IPOs, couple of exits. And the reason why 99%, maybe not 99%, but close to 99% of startup companies or young companies fail is because they fail to sell. They fail to sell. They fail to sell. And I started uh, Better Exec because I believe that there is a better model and there is a better way to help younger companies and even well-established companies to have access to a full-fledged sales team at a fraction of a cost, basically 90% uh, off a regular cost. Uh, no need to hire a VP sales, no need to hire a CMO or a whole team. Um, and we do that as a consulting company. Uh, we do it extremely well. We do it in a very unbiased way because we're not on your payroll. And um, if you're interested, I actually just wrote a book about this, Transforming, Transforming Sales Management. I'm happy to give it away to you guys. And I look forward to um, some constructing feedback. Thanks again. So uh, it, it took me quite a while. To, I, I was waiting for the technology piece, and then it didn't really come. So you're just you're outsourced salespeople, basically, the sales process. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 there is a process, but there is more important to all of the best practices around that. So okay. It's more than just outsourcing. Okay. So, but, but, but it's, it's live interaction, so it's, it's, it's tough to scale. So I think, you know, typically in my experience, investors in, you know, services businesses, tough to get funded because of the scale factor. Oh, we, we're not looking for money. We're uh, truly bootstrapped. Oh, we're, okay. we're kind of living by our own rule, which is our, my own philosophy is, you know, if you can avoid to get fund, funding, right, you should be bootstrapped. Absolutely. Ideal. Fred, right? Fred. Yeah, very well done. I, 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 great presentation. Excellent. Um, I liked everything I heard. I, I, um, again, I have a bias that I think salespeople are the heart and soul of the company. Uh, that's just my bias. Uh, and I also believe that I agree with 100%. That's why most companies fail uh, or have terrible problems because they fail to generate revenue. Now, I have a little difference of a perspective there. I, I don't think it's fail of sales as much as it is hiring the wrong salespeople. It's the same result. But it's the actually the hiring the wrong salespeople because all these technical CEOs here have never hired salespeople before and they don't know how to evaluate them and it's complete and that takes a year to two maybe three years to get that worked out. That's something startups cannot afford to go through. That's the issue. I assume now you have enough expertise on how to get the right salespeople for a given company, product, market, etc. That's what you're doing. So I think it's a pretty viable. And we do it just for a limited period of time so they can do it for three months, right. six months, right. as opposed to investing you know, millions of dollars. And then That's right. To yeah. So cool. well done. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, let's see if I can use this without deafening everybody. Uh, this is definitely my first pitch ever, so bear with me a little here. Oh, Lord. Already already losing it. So uh, my name is John and I am a co-founder of a company called Nofi Hub. And the problem in the status quo is that information providers do not live in 2015. They live back in 1976 when Boolean searching ruled the world. Uh, so anybody who's used it, you know what? Anybody who's used an academic database in the last 20 years knows what a pain in the ass it is to use. So what Nothi Hub is, is an educational portal that integrates students, parents, and publishers all under one umbrella to provide services. 
So what is our first service? Our first service is going to be a digital living evolutionary library that adapts on the fly to the needs of the, of the institution. I.e., as an institution, you tell Nofi Hub what you need, and Nofi Hub spits back the right collection for you. So in that world, what we are aiming to do is aim at a primary, mostly a primary and secondary school market, private schools, charter schools, particularly in emergent nations, where we're going to try to offer information provision at a low price and to change that information provision into information intelligence so that you just don't give somebody a pile of stuff, you give them the tools to turn that pile of stuff into something that they can really use. The problem is, is that we never empower people to build their own. We only empower them to use something else and pay somebody else to do it for them. If we, we believe at Nofi Hub, if we start from the bottom and teach people how to build their own information, their own information tools, that is the way that we're going to, do, to get it done. Thanks. Thank you, John. Hopefully you guys got more luck than I did. John, right? Yeah, John. So, John, a couple of thoughts. You, you, you're pretty good at presenting, but there's a little inten too much intensity there. That's just to kind of give you that. You can lower your vo lower the intensity a little bit here, because you could be, you're not truly conversational, okay? And it, 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 people can shy away from you when they don't need to. Second thing, um, you know, the, the bells that were going off in my head were, doesn't this uh, Google education out there do a lot of that stuff? And you seem in your suggestions to be completely. Um, unaware of that okay now you may not agree with how they do it but google education is making tremendous strides in the world for that matter and you just see teachers adopting google docs google spreadsheets all this kind of stuff and maybe you can do better things maybe you can build a better uh, logical flow on top of google docs and google education but the fact that you passed them by made me question your uh, reasoning and maybe your research so i would do a little more thing you've got some definite good intensity i'd lower the volume I uh, know what I want. What my perspective is about Google Education because it's a it's a gorilla in the room. Sure. Okay. Thank you. All right. Are you all set? Thank you. Finally, my friend right here. <laughs> Woohoo for my friend. Hi, my name is Roy Tan. Um, so I'm first time here. I'm trying to build its uh, lipo analyzer. So lipo pro lipo uh, protein analyzer. Lipo. Yeah. So I think uh, everybody knows uh, you have a lipo protein in your body. But well, lipo protein is uh, it's a protein in your body and with the cholesterols. The cholesterols will kind of have good cholesterols and bad cholesterols. There's a nine billion dollar market. And you go to hospital, draw blood, and then get to analyze the blood. But the most time and 60% of the time doesn't tell you you have good protein or bad protein. Actually, I want to develop an analyzer to separate the bad protein, which is low density proteins, and tell us what is a good low density protein, what is bad low density protein. And I would like to raise some fundings to develop a prototype for it. Thank you. So is this good protein, bad protein? Yeah, <laughs> it's a lipoprotein. Lipoprotein is um, uh, it's a, it's cholesterol proteins uh, inside your body. So most people, uh, if you look at it, there's about 500 people die from heart heart attack. But heart attack disease, you measure looking for lipoproteins to indicate whether or not you have a heart attack. Diagnostic. Diagnosis tools. Start out with that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So I, I guess <coughs> I'm trying to. As I'm thinking through, are you a biomarker company? So you know, there's troponin for you know for cardio. There's you know all these different biomarkers that are measuring. I've got a client that's measuring proteins for TBI. So, are you measuring for a particular indication? Is that where you're going off uh, or first? Yeah. So there's a so there's a so generally generally when do you go to a doctor to try to measure your body's with lipoproteins? There's the full measures you. Triglycerides, so low LDL, high LDL. So those, it's trying to indicate whether or not you have a potential to get a heart attack, a cardiovascular disease. But it, it go through the total measurements, 60% of the time it's wrong. Okay, 60% doesn't give you indicator. Out of those 60% of them, if you die from heart attack disease, 90% of them, 30% uh, of them, you don't know the cause because it does not distinguish the uh, bad pro, uh, bad. The LDLs and the good LDLs. We want to develop a bioanalyzer and to separate that. 
cool. to tell you whether or not you can uh, distinguish okay. that. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Okay, uh, before we go to the next pitch, I want to remind you of these flyers. Um, I'm going to pass them around so you guys can uh, get one if you're interested in, or friends, if you have friends. Uh, this is a paid position, right? Over the summer, a few hours teaching uh, students. Yeah, kids, maybe the friends, university. Okay, so I'm going to pass them around. You can, you can keep one if uh, you want to. Hello. Hello. I'm Dmitry, one of founders of Budgie. Budgie is a finance budget, body and budget. Budgie, yeah. So it's a finance-based travel assistant. It can budget your trip, calculate projected expenses, and offer support in your travel. Because when you plan your trip now, everything you get is tickets for plane and accommodation. All other expenses are very proximate. You never know how much you will spend on restaurants and all together. But how we will get all information for, for this? To get uh, these data analytics, we have created Budget App, an app for tracking and sharing common budgets in the case of the travel, as well as for compiling easy and accurate reports. Uh, group Budgets allows to track new people to the app, and also we get not only personal analytics, but in connection with uh, person's friends. What we really want is to add objective information to the travel advisor sphere, because now, even if you will go to TripAdvisor, for example, everything you can find is very subjective advices from absolutely unknown people. Uh, we know it's very ambitious plans, but it's challenging and uh, we tested. So we made an M MVP with 25,000 downloads in uh, two, two, week, two months. Uh, we have more than 40 publications, um, and we were in App Store, top, top of App Store. We have a very strong team with two lead developers, uh, amazing product designer, and two marketing guys. Thank you. Thank you. OK, what was your name again? Ludwig. Dimitri. Dimitri, OK, all right, good. Well. Um, I, uh, my sense is you just got to, you know, you're in a generic area of, of, of budgeting, financial expense yeah. reports. So nail this real quick. Are you doing corporate expense reporting? You know, are you handling corporate reimbursements? Are you doing, see, no. I was guessing the whole time. Uh, is it personal or is it business? It's a personal. Personal travel. Yeah. Why do I, oh, I mean, I got to pay what I got to pay for dinners and lunches and all this stuff. <laughs> it's not for, uh, you are not our target. In, uh, okay. Who is your target? Uh, in different countries, people call it different, but we call it uh, free packets. So it's people from 25 to 35. They use mobile devices a lot. They use mobiles for... for okay, all right, and all right, all right. So, so now you're dealing with the, uh, the digital literate people. Yeah, but all right. 20, last year, right. it's 20% 20, uh, 20 of all tourist markets. There's no question, it's a big right. market. I'm just saying, right away, define what you're doing you're dealing with a demographic segment of 25 to 35 year olds who live on their cell phone, Absolutely. which is the whole third Absolutely. world. The whole third world. You go to South America, everybody has a cell phone. Yeah. Okay, now you're engaging with those very large populations of young people who are c growing in a consumer behavior, who are accustomed to doing living on a cell phone, and guess what? The vendors are not set up for that stuff, or you know, you're gonna set them up, whatever it might be, okay? That, I, I think you got to reorganize your presentation just to get out that you're dealing with this 25 to 35 year old segment, okay. demographic, and exactly what you're going to do for them. Okay? okay. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think there's probably you know, great potential there. Uh, you know, the kayak, kayak orbits, TripAdvisor, they're absolutely static. You're right. It's just two very you know important variables in a in a trip. So the one thing that I kept that kept going through my mind is you are going to have so much data. Yeah. so much rich data and learn, your algorithms are going to be learning algorithms all the time because you'll pick up on people's habits and you know people of the same sort of socioeconomic you know brackets you'll be able to recommend you'll be able to do all kinds of things so have you filed a whole bunch of patents uh, uh, sorry, I don't do patents have you filed a whole bunch of provisional patents if you haven't you should yeah, and Roger's the guy to talk about. I'm not, okay. I'm not, an, I'm not an IP. I'm not an IP guy, but <laughs> the intellectual property. Okay, the intellectual property. 
All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank so you. You've got all kinds of data coming in. You're going to weight, ma match, yeah. rank, and yeah. then there's some output, and that's where you can put a whole lot of yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you can pass it over. Okay. Hello. 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 Like it? All right. My name is Ben. Ben Portisac. I'm a member here at Founders Floor, so I'm going to give a pitch for a company that uh, I'm thinking about becoming a co-founder for. So the name of the company is Genuity Software and uh, the product is called True Rev and it is an enterprise SaaS play. So it is uh, playing on the revenue recognition model. Uh, there's a lot of subscription-based companies out there right now, and that seems to be the hot space. Everyone's doing it if you're touching enterprise at all. There's a new accounting pronouncement coming out that hits the US, uh, US GAAP and International Financial Reporting Standards, which is called ASC 606, and that is coming out in 2017. In the meantime, there's still a big demand for companies to do revenue recognition. Um, there's players in the market on the enterprise level, but there really is none at the SMB. So what we've developed is TrueRev, which is a turbo tax for revenue recognition. So I'm a CTO, and I really don't have any technical chops when it comes to accounting. So how do I do my revenue recognition? I hire a CPA. This will take that out of the equation. You can do automated billing. It'll be middleware between your Chargeify account and your QuickBooks account. So you'll be able to uh, integrate the information back and forth. If you want to do automated invoicing out of the platform, you can do that as well. And it's definitely a uh, SaaS play with uh, recurring revenues monthly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ben, you identified a real problem, and I just want to give you credit right up front. You have identified pain. Revenue recognition is a pain for any any company really that uh, has to deliver a service in the future for something they're paid for today. And uh, how valuable that is, how big that is, is debatable. I have to take care of it because we receive tuition over at First Focus. That's for future uh, delivery of service paid today. So it is an issue. I don't know if you're, the 2017 uh, accounting statement is going to address it differently, but I'm not sure how many small businesses will pick it up. I, you know, that's something you're going to have to deal with. I don't know if you have validation, how many small businesses deal with it. Uh, it would be good to know that. Other than that, I like the way you have your facts together, the logical conclusion. Uh, you probably got to do a little more due diligence yourself on the company, but you did a good presentation. Thank you. I echo those comments. The one thing I would just say, you know, you've got very few uh, uh, seconds and they're precious, make them really count. I think if you just say we're a B2B SaaS company, everybody will get it. You don't have to spend a minute going through that. Yeah. yeah. And, w and one thing also, uh, you, you are a successful entrepreneur, you sold companies before. I would mention that as well, adding to your credibility. Nothing gets a meeting quicker than the word cereal. <laughs> <laughs> How many times did you sell the company? Enough. <laughs> Enough that I'm a member. <laughs> okay. Anyone else pitching? Okay. Last one. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Leon, and I'm a founder of uh, Job Exler. Uh, Job Exler. The Job Exler is a, a video interview platform for recruiters that um, allows to reduce the time uh, required for job interview. How many of you job interview? I think everyone. So uh, job interview is uh, uh, one of the most time consuming uh, process in the uh, recruitment process, part of the recruitment. Um, so what uh, job does? Um, as a recruiter, you create a list of questions um, and invite all your candidates with just one click using their emails. And candidates record their video answers to your questions at home or that convenience. And then recruiter, you uh, watch this video, you rate your candidates, you choose uh, the best one, and you can also share this video with your colleagues or with the managers. So uh, JobExler allows you to save time, save money, and it's also a convenient way for candidates to go through job interview. Uh, we have working better, 
we have a uh, few happy clients and we have very good uh, team. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, you know, this is a uh, pretty crowded space recruiting and uh, I, I know of a number of companies that are doing it with video, so I wasn't quite sure what the killer app was for you, what the differentiator was, if you're doing something in a different way that uh, other people are not, but maybe you could just you know touch on that in your presentation. It is very crowded. I've seen uh, companies do this. I've seen them as much as three and four years ago do it and uh, I failed to get traction. Um, it's very tough. I, I'm not sure why, because you would think that a video would just be fine, but there's something about the uh, inefficiency and the quality that the person's just answering questions in their own house. It's better than nothing, but I, I, I'm not, I think you're gonna have to deal with the execution and sales cycle. That's, where's Fred here? Fred's a sales guy. I think if you talk to Fred, he'll tell you, or give you some ideas about how do you gotta sell this thing? It's a pretty tough sale, but you may find a way to do it. I think you do wanna work a little bit more in the presentation, and get it logically set up. You know, get to the point right away. You you were pretty good, but I think if you reorganize a little bit, exactly what you do. The cost of recruiting is enormous. You know, get some figures, you can go out and get that on the internet. The cost of bad hires is enormous, but think of all the time that's taken up with people interviewing the same person three, four, five times. With a video, you can save a lot of time right away. Thank you. I think just personally, I, I was an for 10 years, and when I sold my company, I had about 600 employees that had gone through maybe a thousand you know to get those 600 i think if i would have had a video i think i could have told it you know i would have known in 10 seconds that right. person wasn't for me so i absolutely get the value and i also don't understand why it really hasn't become so successful it, cool. you know rather than spending an hour with somebody in the office so mm -hmm. i think uh just figure out a way to sell it sure great thank you so much